Let me start this video with some initial thoughts. This story is certainly an unsolved murder case that has odd and mysterious details that, of course, piqued my curiosity and the desire to create this video. But I have questions, and I'm curious, is this truly a completely cold case that is unsolvable? Or has law enforcement just accepted what they have and are no longer investigating? Stay tuned to the end to find out if you have more questions than I do about this case. Join me for a ride through Strange and Mysterious here at Odd Mysteries Stories. In the heart of Oregon, nestled among its verdant landscapes, Richard Cowden, age 28, his wife Belinda, age 22, and their young children, David, age 5, and Melissa, just five months old, called White City their home. Richard, a dedicated family man, earned their living driving logging trucks through the dense forests that characterize this part of the United States. The family, including their basset hound named Droopy, made a spontaneous decision to spend the 1974 Labor Day weekend camping near Carberry Creek in Copper, Oregon. This wasn't just any impromptu family outing. It was a return to a beloved area, a place filled with family memories and the comforting familiarity of Belinda's mother, Ruth Grayson, living nearby in the now-submerged town of Copper. The tale of their journey begins on August 30, when they arrived at their chosen campground, an area they had visited many times before. They parked their 1956 Ford pickup truck a short walk from the campsite along Carberry Creek Road. This trip was a deviation from their initial plans. Richard, having served as a sergeant in the United States Air Force before transitioning to civilian life, had intended to spend the weekend working on their home's driveway. However, a mechanical hiccup with their truck diverted their course towards the lush expanses of the Rogue River National Forest campground just outside Copper's town limits. Copper, a town that ceased to exist after being flooded to create Applegate Lake in 1980, holds a rich historical tapestry. In 1978, the Corps of Engineers built a dam across the Applegate River, 15 miles upstream of Rutsch, birthing Applegate Lake. This area, steeped in history, houses the grave of Lindsay Applegate in its submerged cemetery, an early explorer who, in 1848, led settlers through the Rogue River Valley to the California mines, leaving his name to grace the valley and the lake that now cradles Carberry Creek. Carberry Creek itself, named after local mining industry businessman Jim Carberry, serves as a poignant reminder of the region's vibrant past. Why would the Cowden family choose this particular spot for their Labor Day outing adventure? Was it the allure of the familiar, the call of the wild, or perhaps a blend of both, coupled with the unexpected twist of fate presented by a broken truck? On the morning of September 1, 1974, Richard Cowden and his son David stepped into the Copper General Store around 9 a.m. Richard's simple purchase of milk marked the final recorded moment of the Cowden family before they vanished into the dense folds of the Siskiyou Mountains near Copper, Oregon. This seemingly mundane act preceded one of Oregon's most profound mysteries, transforming an ordinary family outing into a case that would capture the attention of a nation. The disappearance of Richard Cowden, his wife Belinda June Cowden, and their children David James Phillips and Melissa Dawn Cowden escalated into a massive search operation one of the largest in Oregon's history. Their story, described as both haunting and baffling, has been dissected and discussed by media outlets nationwide, including the New York Post, becoming a gloomy chapter in the state's annal. As dusk fell on the day of their disappearance, anticipation turned to alarm. Belinda's mother, living a mere stone's throw from the campsite, expected the family for dinner. Their absence prompted a visit to the campsite which revealed a scene both ordinary and unsettling. The camp appeared as if momentarily vacated, a dishpan of cold water on the ground, the family's truck keys, and Belinda's purse left on a picnic table in plain sight. Nearby, a diaper bag, a fully assembled camp stove, and the half-full carton of milk bought that morning painted a picture of abrupt abandonment. The discovery of Richard's wallet, containing $21, the modern equivalent of approximately $135 in 2024, and his expensive Rolex wristwatch, alongside an opened pack of cigarettes identified as Belinda's, deepened the mystery. Notably absent were the family's bathing suits from inside the family's truck, suggesting a planned return. 
This chilling scene, underscored by the undisturbed positioning of their belongings and the family truck parked on the road, prompted an immediate call to authorities. The arrival of the sheriff, state troopers, and officers from the District 3 Office of the Oregon State Police marked the beginning of an official investigation. Despite the eerie calm of the campsite, the lack of obvious signs of violence initially delayed the realization of the gravity of the situation. Lieutenant Mark Kezar later acknowledged this delay, while Officer Erickson remarked on the unsettling atmosphere of the camp, highlighted by the still present container of milk, as State Trooper Officer Erickson later recalled, that camp was spooky. Even the half-used container of milk was still on the table. The plot took a heartbreaking turn the following morning with the discovery of the Cowden's pet basset hound, Droopy, scratching at the front door of the Copper General store. This loyal companion's return alone served as a silent testament to the abruptness of the family's disappearance, adding a layer of emotional complexity to an already perplexing case. Imagine being one of the law enforcement people showing up at the scene, nothing seemingly out of the ordinary except the missing bathing suits. Do you start by checking the nearest swimming area? There's no sign of any violence or even robbery with valuables available in plain sight. The search for the Cowden family, launched following their disappearance, swiftly grew into one of the largest operations in Oregon's history. This extensive effort saw the collaboration of state and local police, alongside a remarkable assembly of volunteers, explorer scouts, members of the United States Forest Service, and the Oregon National Guard. Why, one might wonder, would such a vast array of resources be mobilized for this case? The answer lies in the urgency and the baffling nature of the Cowden's sudden vanishing. In a meticulous sweep, the U.S. Forest Service combed through 25 miles of roads and trails near the campsite, while the skies were scanned by helicopters and planes equipped with infrared photography. This advanced technology was deployed in hopes of detecting recently disturbed soil, a potential indicator of hastily concealed evidence, or, more grimly, a burial site. Despite these Herculean efforts and the cutting-edge technology at their disposal, no trace of a crime was unearthed. The investigative efforts didn't stop at physical searches. The Oregon State Police and Jackson County Police undertook a comprehensive interviewing process, speaking with over 150 individuals. What might these interviews have uncovered, if anything, about the Cowden's last known movements or potential suspects? The community's involvement was further amplified by a substantial reward offer, $2,000, the modern equivalent to about $12,000 in 2024, for any information leading to the resolution of the family's disappearance. Amid the growing despair, Richard Cowden's sister made a heartfelt appeal through a letter to the Medford Mail Tribune. She urged hunters, soon to populate the woods for the 1974 hunting season, to be vigilant for any signs that could unravel the mystery of the Cowden family's fate. This call to action, emphasizing the importance of even the smallest clue, highlights the family's dwindling hope yet unwavering desire for answer. How might a hunter's keen observation in the wilderness contribute to solving this perplexing case? The community's plea for answers reached the halls of power with over 200 citizens writing to then Oregon Senator Mark Hatfield requesting FBI involvement. However, this request was denied, rooted in the absence of evidence suggesting the Cowdens had been kidnapped or taken across state lines. Was this a missed opportunity for a breakthrough or a reflection of the limitations faced by law enforcement in such mysterious circumstances? As the investigation continued, Authorities explored the possibility of a connection between the Cowden's disappearance and other missing persons cases in Washington and Oregon. At the time, eight women had vanished under similar mysterious circumstances. Could there have been a sinister link between these disappearances and that of the Cowden family? This avenue of investigation took a chilling turn when it was revealed that the disappearances of these eight women were attributed to the notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. What implications did this discovery have for the understanding of the Cowden's case, and did it steer the investigation in a new direction, or merely add another layer of complexity to an already intricate mystery? Seven months after, the Cowden family vanished into the vast and verdant wilderness of Oregon. A pivotal discovery shattered the silence that had enveloped their case. 
It was April 12, 1975, when two gold prospectors, wandering through the woods near Carberry Creek, stumbled upon a grim scene that would finally offer some answers, but also deepen the mystery in other ways. These prospectors, hailing from Forest Grove, Oregon, and hiking in the vicinity of the Rogue River, made a chilling discovery approximately seven miles from where the Cowden family had set their camp. They found a skull and nearby, a body tied to a tree, identified as Richard Cowden through subsequent investigation. Not far from Richard, in a cave-like space, about 100 feet away, beneath a massive rock, lay Belinda Cowden and the children, concealed from the casual glance of passers-by. The identification of the bodies was confirmed through dental records, revealing a heartbreaking end to a family's disappearance. The autopsies painted a harrowing picture. Belinda and her son David met their ends through 22 caliber gunshot wounds, while the youngest, five-month-old Melissa, suffered fatal head trauma. The exact cause of Richard's death remained a mystery, though it was speculated he died where his body was found. The circumstances suggested a scenario where Belinda and the children might have been killed elsewhere before being hidden in their rocky grave. This discovery prompted a renewed search for a murder weapon, though none was found. Lieutenant Kezar, reflecting on the evidence, surmised the perpetrator was likely a local, familiar with the cave and its potential as a grim hiding place. This theory was eerily supported by a resident of Grant's Pass who claimed to have searched the very cave during initial search efforts in September, only to find it empty. His testimony, confirmed by a revisit to the site with law enforcement, added a chilling layer to the investigation. The bodies had been placed there after the area had been searched. But let's step back to the day of their disappearance. Interviews with fellow campers revealed a curious encounter. A family from Los Angeles, present at the campground on September 1st, reported seeing two men and a woman in a pickup truck, behaving suspiciously as if waiting for witnesses to leave. The father recalled they acted like they were waiting for us to leave, and frankly they made us nervous, so we moved on. This fleeting observation adds a perplexing element to the case. Who were these individuals and what, if any, connection did they have to the Cowden family's fate? The recovery of the Cowden family's remains raises a cascade of questions. How did the perpetrators manage to evade the extensive search efforts only to return the bodies to a previously searched location? What does the method of disposing of the bodies tell us about the killer or killers? The separation of Richard from his family tied to a tree while the others were hidden in a cave, suggests a deliberate and cruel strategy, painting a picture of a crime both calculated and cold. Law enforcement considered Dwayne Lee Little of Rutch, who was 25 at the time of the family's disappearance, a suspect in the Cowden murders. Little had been paroled from the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem on May 24, 1974, three months before the disappearance of the Cowden. At 16 in 1964, he had raped and murdered teenager Orla Fay Phipps. State police were able to determine that Little had been in copper over the Labor Day weekend at the approximate time the Cowden family disappeared. Little's former girlfriend told law enforcement that she had seen him with a 22 caliber gun during Christmas time in 1974. On January 12, 1975, his parole was revoked after she informed police of his possession of a firearm. Little was paroled again on April 26, 1977. On June 2, 1980, Little picked up a pregnant 23-year-old named Margie Hunter, whose car had broken down near Portland, Oregon, and sexually assaulted and beat her. Hunter and her unborn child survived, and Little was charged and convicted of attempted homicide and sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. Police later suspected that the two men and woman in a truck reported by the Los Angeles family at the campground were in fact Little and his parents, as their truck matched the description provided by the family. Little and his parents denied any knowledge of the Cowden's disappearances. However, a miner who owned a cabin nearby claimed that Little and his parents had stopped by on Monday, September 2, 1974, and signed the guest book he kept for visitors. Additionally, Rusty Kelly, an inmate who at one time shared a cell with Little, later claimed that Little confessed to the Cowden's murders. Despite the voluminous circumstantial evidence, Little has never been charged with the murders of the Cowden family.
What needs to be put out there right away is that I have so many questions that my research was unable to find answers to this case. I also hope that if you were following along, you have some of your own. First, let me backtrack through the details. It is obvious that the term suspects shouldn't be plural. It seems like law enforcement may have such a strong belief that there is only one suspect. If there is knowledge of the little family, Signing a guest book on September 2nd at a nearby cabin? Is that a part of collected evidence in this case? When Little violated his parole in 1975 by being in possession of a firearm, what happened to the firearm? Wouldn't law enforcement be able to confirm the firearm he had with the bullets found in Belinda and David? Once it was acknowledged by another inmate that he confessed to the crime, was he ever interviewed to determine if he actually had knowledge of the killings, or was he just another criminal seeking prison, cred by bragging about another crime he may or may not have committed? From what I could determine, Dwayne Little is still alive and in some prison somewhere and could easily be accessed by law enforcement seeking to close this cold, unsolved case. So, that's some of the questions I have about solving this unsolved murder. Let's not forget the family and their relatives that have long endured the pain of this murder. What level of depravity in a human can go to the level of how the children in this family were slaughtered? Think about how the campsite was found. It was almost as if they had just got up and walked away from the campsite. How on earth did someone manage to gain control of the whole family so abruptly without any witnesses? I'm sure my viewers like you have questions and maybe even details I may not have been able to locate on this case. I welcome you to share your thoughts and comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video and are enjoying the videos on my channel. My name is Vince, and if possible, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting new videos each Monday and Friday. Clicking the little bell will send you a notification when a new video is posted. In the meantime, I invite you to watch one of my other videos on your screen. Thank you.